Hello, and welcome to the first episode of Project Mira. Today, we will briefly overview Mira and its celestial bodies before discussing what early life may have looked like. Borea, the sun that Mira orbits, is a G-class star. It's 20% larger than our sun, and it's twice as bright, which places our habitable zone here, between 1.37 and 1.97 AU. Mira rests comfortably at 1.61 AU. It has a sister planet located at 1.42 AU, but we will talk about that in another project. The Miran year will take 681 Earth days, or 560 local days. There will be 28 months per year, with each month taking 24 Earth days, or 20 local days. Finally, a day on Mira will take 29 Earth hours, or 24 local hours. On Mira, there are three continents, Dalbukt, Anfair, and Neith. We will begin plotting the continent's movements at 3 billion years ago, since this is when life begins on the planet. The plate tectonics over time will look like this. As you can see, the continents begin separate and slowly fuse over time. The creatures on the continents will have to compete for resources when the collision takes place, making for interesting evolution choices. Now that we have the basic information for our planet, we can begin working on the creatures that will reside in the early oceans. From the primordial seas will algae-like plants rise, coating the surface of the water. This will make for a perfect food source for the young ocean. The algae will be a deep blue in color, nearly purple. This is because the plant will absorb green and red light and reflect blue light. Because of this, we will call it Blastroma, or Blue Layer. The first creatures to feed on Blastroma are tiny octopods with hairy tentacles. The hairs will allow it to detect and consume food by dragging the Blastroma, as well as other smaller organisms, into its mouth. It will have no through gut and therefore must spit up any waste it produces. Being quite small, only 0.5 to 1.5 centimeters, it will be considered zooplankton because it cannot fight the ocean currents. This creature will reproduce via broadcast spawning, which means it will produce spores that will traverse the ocean upon sexual maturity. The spores will be produced from the same hole that it eats and expels waste from. Once it has reached maturity, it will send out its spores and die, fulfilling its purpose. It is for this reason that it will live only 10 Earth days. We will call this creature Octobracid, or Eight Arms. But the Octobracid is not the only creature that appears in the primordial seas around this time. A long, segmented creature with fins on each segment will emerge. This creature will be capable of using its fins to struggle against the current, but cannot swim independently of it. The fin's larger purpose is to push water over its gills so that it may absorb the oxygen in the water better. Though it will not be able to see, it will have a small cluster of nerve cells at the front of its body, allowing it to sense movement and chase down prey, such as smaller octobracid or forage for blastroma. The consumed food will traverse its through gut before being expelled from its rear end. When it reaches its maximum size of 0.75 centimeters, it will reproduce asexually by splitting long ways down the middle. It only takes a couple of days to reach maturity, and it will reproduce about twice per day until it dies approximately 45 days after being born. We will call this creature Septosoma for its seven bodies. By this time, the ocean will be teeming with life. Creatures will now begin specializing to fill niche roles. The first new creature we will talk about descends from the Septosoma. Its body will be streamlined, and it will use its fins far less in favor of subcharangiform swimming. 
This means that it will undulate the back half of its body for greater speed and precision. Being a much better swimmer than its previous form, it needs to be able to sense its surroundings. Since it already has a small cluster of nerve cells on its head, it is reasonable to assume that those nerves would further develop into six eyes. These eyes will be primitive and won't be able to see color, but the creature will be able to sense movement and basic shapes. This will be perfect for the creature, as it will be the first predator on Mira. It will hunt any creature smaller than itself and will have no predators. Its reproductive cycle will change from asexual to sexual reproduction now that it can see and find other creatures of the same species. Basic gonads will form inside the anus of the creature, which will allow it to exchange genetic material with a mate. The creature will be unisex, and thus will be able to mate with any fertile creature of the same species. Compared to other existing creatures, it will grow to be quite large, reaching sizes of 3.5 centimeters and above. It takes longer to mature than Septosoma, a whole week in fact, but it lives for up to one and a half years, allowing it plenty of time to reproduce. Their numbers will explode until the other creatures in the ocean evolve to counteract the new predator's hunting abilities. This creature will be called Grigorizalia, or Fast Swimmer. The ocean floor is now covered with a blanket of detritus, or waste. To fill the niche of detritivore, Septosoma may choose to repurpose its fins as simple legs to allow it to crawl along the seabed. On the top of its body will form four large and primitive eyes to sense danger approaching. It will flatten its body as well to protect itself from predators, but will retain its body segments. In the front near its mouth, its legs will fill the role of mandibles, pulling food into its mouth. Its rearmost legs will act as gonopods, for this creature will change its form of reproduction from asexual to sexual. The gonopods will allow it to better secure itself to its mate, which will increase clutch sizes. It may be beneficial to the creature to separate itself into two sexes. The male will provide DNA to the female, and the female will develop its young in a separate chamber from its through gut. This will allow its offspring to develop without fear of predators. The female will have to consume a higher quantity of food in order to nourish its young before giving birth. Its clutch size will be between 10 and 20, and when it is time for its offspring to emerge, the creature will die, giving them a feast before sending them off into the ocean. The males will continue to propagate until their death around two and a half years after being born. The creature will grow until its death, reaching sizes up to 8 centimeters. Because of its larger size, it may develop a type of blood, perhaps copper-based. This means that the creature will appear blue, as it has yet to form a skin, so its blood will be visible through its membrane. The creature will be called Planusoma, or flat body. While Planusoma may accidentally eat Scavabracket on occasion, some may opt to specialize in consuming that creature. To better locate its prey, its eyes may move to the front of its body, with two of them becoming larger. Its front two legs may form into claws, which will aid in scooping up any scava bracket it comes across. To further prevent itself from being eaten by Gregorozalia, it may also harden its membrane using aragonite found in the shallow ocean. Aragonite isn't stable, but has formed in marine life before on Earth, and as long as the creature stays near the shallows, it will be a serviceable exoskeleton. The exoskeleton will have no pigment, and so will be white in color. There will be tiny holes for it to breathe through called spiracles. This creature will reproduce in the same way as its predecessor and may grow up to 12 centimeters in size during its lifespan. It will be named Duncana Bracket for its claw arms. Scavabracket may adapt to their new predator by becoming larger. This will create another need for blood, as the nutrients that are consumed will not be able to spread through the creature's body without it. On this occasion, the creature may opt for iron-based blood, as iron is readily available in the ocean. The new creature, for this reason, will appear reddish, pink in color. But becoming larger won't be enough to stop Dinkana Bracket from consuming it, 
so it may also evolve a shell. The shell will be made from calcium phosphate, a material that has appeared in many animals on Earth, including humans. Calcium phosphate is sturdy and readily available, so the creature's size will only be limited by how much oxygen is available. It will develop its shell after it has found a location to burrow, making it vulnerable during its youth. With its larger size, it will be able to eat just about anything that gets too close, so its diet may shift to include living creatures rather than just marine snow. The hairs on its tentacles may shorten to be nearly invisible to the naked eye, but will still be vastly sensitive as the creature develops a basic nervous system. Broadcast spawning will continue to be this creature's method of sexual reproduction, and its young will look incredibly similar to scaphobracid young and octobracid. The creature may grow to be 20 centimeters and may live as long as 5 years. This creature will be called Panoplosoma, or armor body. So far, we've covered several animal evolutions, but Blastroma is likely to evolve as well. It may continue to float along the surface of the ocean so as to absorb the most sunlight. Its appearance may shift from that of algae to more like that of a lily pad, but instead of roots, it may opt to form flotation sacs on the underside. This will allow the plant to float with ease. The air sacs may be surrounded by dense fibers to prevent any accidental popping, and may be where most of the nutrients are stored. This is because the dense fibers will make it difficult to digest. Blastroma produces by spreading its gametes into the ocean, and it will continue to do so as this new plant-like form. Astrophilus, or star plant, is what we will name it. Being a new food source, some creatures may evolve to consume Astrophilus. One such creature might be Grigorazalea, which may adapt by converting its mandibles into more specialized claws suitable for tearing plant matter. Its fins and tail may further specialize for better swimming. This creature may grow to large sizes and thus will develop blood. The blood will once again be iron-based, but the creature will not appear red. With as large as it will get, it will likely have a thicker membrane than its predecessor. This membrane may develop a blue pigment to better camouflage itself in the ocean waters. Only the young will be affected by this change, as the creature will grow to be too large to be eaten by any existing predators. Its reproductive cycle may change to include male and female gametes for better success with reproduction. The female may envelop her developing young in a sac filled with a nutritious yolk, allowing her offspring to be born fully mature. She may choose to bury her eggs to keep predators from devouring the clutch. Once her eggs have been laid, she will leave them to fend for themselves as she goes off to find a new mate. The young will hatch and take two weeks to mature, growing up to 45 centimeters during its 10-year lifespan. This creature will be called Voscostoma for its grazer mouth. Voscostoma will graze on the leaves of Astrophilus, but the air sacs will be left uneaten. Perhaps the young of Scavabracid may adapt to live near the cover of Astrophilus. This will provide food and shelter, and if they were to adapt to exclusively eat the air sacs, they would be avoiding competition with Voscostoma. Currently, Scavabracid is radially symmetrical, but if it were to begin consuming Astrophilus, it may adapt to be bilaterally symmetrical. It may develop two of its tentacles into grasping arms with claws at the end, the claws will be perfect for tearing into fibrous material. With a new, highly nutritious source of food, the creature will likely evolve rather quickly, using its remaining tentacles as a way to get around. It may grow six eyes, three on each side of its body, to spot predators such as Gregorazalea. When it spots a predator, it will either flee or strike back with its claws. Its claws can also be used to grasp mates, which will be useful since it will have evolved to prefer sexual reproduction. The creature will reproduce by exchanging gametes from its mouth with a mate. The female will hold on to the gametes in a specialized organ. The organ will be connected to its mouth hole, but will also be separate from its stomach. When it is time for the young to be born, the mother will die, leaving a first meal for its offspring. 
The females will grow larger faster, but because the males will live longer, the maximum size of 20 centimeters will be the same for both. Females will live as long as one year, and males will live on average three years. This creature will be known as Schizima Brachid for its tearing arms. Schizima Brachid and Voskostoma will live in peace and harmony for millennia, that is until their numbers grow exponentially. Astrophilus will decrease in number, leaving demand for a predator. One such predator may come from Voskostoma, as its razor mandibles will be perfectly suitable for the task. To specialize in hunting Schizima Brachid and smaller Voskostoma, this creature may enlarge its mandibles to better grab and rip its prey apart. This will make it easier for it to swallow its food. Its fins may change to be shark-like, allowing for better stabilization, and it may change from some carangiform swimming to thuniform. Thuniform swimming is the method of choice for the fastest swimmers on Earth, and is perfect for a predator of the seas. This creature will continue to reproduce in the same way as Voskostoma, but its young will mature within 10 days and will only grow up to 35 centimeters. The longest lived of this creature will die around seven and a half years after hatching. We will name this creature Traumastoma, or Terror Mouth. The creatures of Mira have evolved over a period of a hundred million years, populating the ocean with life. In the next episode, we will cover the open ocean and what sort of life may develop there. If you're interested in seeing what kind of creatures might evolve in future episodes, or have suggestions or ideas of your own, consider joining my Project Mira Discord server. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. I hope to see you there.